At this year's 2015 ASCO meeting, one of the big headline stories was about a drug called daratumumab. And it is here, too, in Chicago at the ASH meeting on hematologic malignancies. Also this summer, uh, saw the start of the daratumumab FDA application and review process, so you'll probably be hearing more about this drug. And I am here to talk with uh, Dr. Peter Voorhees, who is an associate professor in the School of Medicine at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And let's start with the basics. What's sure. daratumumab? So daratumumab is a monoclonal antibody, a human monoclonal antibody that binds to CD38. Uh, CD38 is a cell surface protein that's expressed at very high levels on plasma cells. And the nice thing about it is it's expressed at you know, much lesser levels on a subset of other white blood cells and on very little other cells in the body. So it's a fairly targeted therapy, which makes it unique. Well, at ASCO, you reported some really unprecedented uh, responses when this was used as monotherapy in some uh, pretty heavily pretreated patients. Before we talk about what you're presenting here, can sure. you just review with us that presentation at ASCO? Sure. So the ASCO presentation was with regards to the phase two serious study. So this was a uh, phase two study looking at daratumumab monotherapy in patients with relapsed and refractory multiple myeloma. So in order to be eligible for this particular protocol, you had to be heavily pretreated and have fairly resistant disease. So specifically, not only did you have to have relapsed multiple myeloma, but you had to be refractory to your most recent therapy. In other words, you have to have progressed on or within 60 days of the last dose of your last treatment. Um, in addition to that, you had to have had at least three prior lines of therapy or if you were proteasome inhibitor resistant, in other words, resistant to either bortezomib or carfilzomib, and imid resistant, so uh, resistant to either thalidomide, lenalidomide, or pomalidomide, or all of the above, you could be eligible for the study regardless of the number of lines that you'd previously received. So at the end of the day, uh, again, a, a very refractory uh, patient population. So the way that the study worked is that you know, patients you know, were initially, uh, a small cohort of patients were assigned to one of two dosing uh, strategies of daratumumab. Um, and the strategy that ultimately won the day was the 16 milligram per kilogram uh, dose cohort. And the way that it was administered, it was given once a week for the first two cycles. So a cycle of therapy consists of a four week period. So it was given weekly for the first two cycles, so eight weekly doses. For the following four cycles, it was given every two weeks. And then from cycle seven and beyond, it was just given once every four weeks. And what we saw in this particular study is that the overall response rate was an impressive 29%. Um, not only that, but you know, many of the responses uh, were durable. Uh, we also saw deep responses in this particular group of patients. So not only did we just see partial responses, but there were patients who achieved what we call a very good partial response, or greater than 90% reduction in disease burden. And there were several patients who, in fact, achieved stringent, complete responses. So that was all very encouraging. Um, more recently, with longer follow-up, we've actually gotten at the median overall survival, which is a little over 17 months, which is far longer than what we would have expected in this patient population. Because the important thing to recognize here is that these were patients that were not just you know, refractory to bortezomib and lenalidomide, but many of these patients had received prior pomalidomide therapy. Many of these patients had received prior carfilzomib therapy. And many of those patients were refractory to the newer agents as well. Now, here at the ASH meeting, you're looking at management of infusion-related reactions following this particular monotherapy. Sure. And what did you find when you did the analysis of what are these people experiencing? Sure. Well, certainly, whenever you're developing a, a monoclonal antibody, infusion-related reactions are certainly something that you have to be worried about. And it certainly was the most common you know, adverse event that was experienced for these patients. So looking specifically, um, and basically the purpose of this presentation is to really kind of focus in on the infusion-related reactions and to better understand them and characterize them. Um, because hopefully as this moves forward, you know, that will provide you know, community oncologists you know, with the you know, wherewithal to, to be able to manage these things. So what we found is, is that in the 16 milligram per kilogram dose cohort in this particular phase two study, the serious study, 43% uh, of patients had infusion-related reactions. And when I say infusion-related reactions, the sorts of symptoms that I'm describing would be uh, nasal congestion and rhinorrhea. Um, people had um, kind of a tickle or irritation in the back of their throat, not laryngeal swelling or anything like that, but just the tickle in the back of the throat. Some patients experienced uh, dyspnea. 
um, a small group of patients experienced nausea or vomiting, um, and in uh, just a few cases we saw some bronchospasm. Um, thankfully, the vast majority of these reactions were grade one and two in severity, so there are actually very few grade three infusion-related reactions, and there were no grade four uh, infusion reactions. Not only that, but you know there was not a single patient on the study that had to discontinue therapy because of infusion-related reactions. Yeah. Congratulations on that, because that's difficult. This is a difficult group of patients, clearly. Right. So these patients are, you know, you know, I, I, perhaps a bit sicker, you know, going into therapy than you know a patient, you know, with a recent diagnosis of multiple myeloma. So the fact that they were able to tolerate this well, you know, is very reassuring. The other thing that I should note is that, you know, the vast majority of the infusion reactions actually occurred within the first dose. So when you look at the uh, rates of infusion reactions with the first dose, it was approximately 37, 38 percent. When you go to the second dose, you know, it's between three and four percent. And then, and then when you look at that. dose three and beyond that, the cumulative total of those infusions is somewhere around seven, eight percent. So by far and away, and this has been our experience as well, yeah, and that's, that, that's fairly typical, very similar to the rituximab story. Now, when I saw a list of the, uh, the side effects people were experiencing, uh, uh, several of them were respiratory. Does that get to the mechanism of this drug at all? I mean, why respiratory? So I, I think that that's still uh, a work in progress, you know, but there certainly is a lot of interest, you know, as to why. I mean, so there's kind of, you know, so we see the bronchospasm, we see the upper, you know, nasorespiratory uh, symptoms. So there's probably something to it. Um, interestingly, anecdotally, uh, some uh, investigators who've been working, you know, with daratumumab for a while now have started using monolucast or Singulair, you know, as part of their pre-medication cocktail for these patients. And at least on the anecdotal side of things, it seems to help. So it suggests that there's kind of a asthma, seasonal allergy almost quality to it. So there may be some you know, overlapping mechanisms of action there. And at the end of the infusion, what do they get? So as far as pre-medications are concerned that were required, so they had to get a 100 milligram dose of IV methylprednisolone or its corticosteroid equivalent. Right. Um, they got 650 to 1,000 milligrams of acetaminophen and 25 to 50 milligrams of diphenhydramine. Um, if they did experience an infusion reaction, you know, typically occurred within the first 60 to 90 minutes, the infusion would be stopped. Um, additional uh, medications could potentially be administered at that point um, as uh, was fit. Um, as far as the post-infusion medications are concerned, uh, patients were required to take a 20 milligram dose of methylprednisolone um, for two days after their infusion, so a very low dosage. Now, in terms of what's next, this is an ongoing study, correct? So there are still patients that are being treated on this study. But as far as what's next, I mean, there's a wealth of daratumumab studies. So the important thing to recognize is that while the infusion reactions are common, they are manageable. But most importantly, there are very little other side effects associated with this particular antibody, which again gets at the fact that it's a very targeted mechanism of action. So there's very little in the way of uh, hematologic toxicity as far as neutropenia, anemia, thrombocytopenia. It doesn't cause neuropathy, for example. It doesn't cause much in the way of gastrointestinal side effects. So it's very easy to combine it with other myeloma therapy platforms. And you can think of any myeloma regimen that's out there currently, daratumumab is being added to it in the context of multiple phase three studies that are ongoing. I suspect there's going to be more headlines in the months ahead, wouldn't you say? Absolutely.